Welcome back to the Zero Weakness Podcast, where we talk about how to be a better lifter, how to be a better coach, and everything in between. Make sure you subscribe and enjoy. All right, welcome back to another week, week, another episode of the Zero Weakness Podcast. This podcast is sponsored by Establishment Coffee Co. Go to establishmentcoffee.com. Get your coffees. That's it. Dot com dot au. Isn't that a T? Yeah, I can't it's a read mine right now. <laughs> Use the code zero twenty five and get twenty five percent off your order and free shipping. We are back um, after a week of a week of absence. Is that mm. what we're going to call it? Yes. Um, no, it was the it was the uh, absence of presence. Absence of presence. Yes. Okay. <laughs> the presence of strength was absent. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully it's more present at my next yeah. comp. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> I'm just not going to speak anymore. <laughs> oh. oh gosh, we're back with the team. We're back with Thomas. Hello, um, Thomas. What has been your grievance this week? Oh, well, CJ, you haven't been to Africa, have you? No, See, I in Africa, <laughs> you learn pretty quickly that you know, the problems we have here are quite minimal. So. This week, there is no grievance because Ooh. I've learned that, um, you know, the disparity... Uh, funny, in Africa, one of the places I was staying in, the it was a luxury apartment. <laughs> They're really cheap. That's why I <laughs> stayed so luxurious. It's like $100 a night. Anyway, the luxury apartment I was staying in, the shower control in that building was terrible. You'd set it on one temperature and you'd be showering and go like boiling hot and then freezing cold, just waving between the two. And normally I'd get really angry, but... You stand outside and like there's this extreme disparity between rich and poor over there. So you see absolute poverty and then absolute richness. And so you can't really get upset because you're like, well, I'm in the category can, that can live a good life and there's all these poor people around me. But there is a grievance this week. So <laughs> the grievance is you guys have been on planes before and, and a few of you have done like long haul flights, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I call them the white walkers. The white walkers are my grievance of the week. And basically the white walkers other old people that just pace the entire flight. Mm. They just go up and down the plane nonstop. And they're sitting there like doing their marches and like doing their exercises. And it's just really annoying. It's always the hands behind the back as well. The slight lean forward. That's how I walk. <laughs> <laughs> hang on. Hang on. <laughs> yeah, no, uh. you're right. And so even worse, so... I flew on like an upgradable standby ticket. So on the way back, I was lucky enough to get business class and you get beds, you can lie down. And so, so nice. I was lying down with a blanket over my head and a white walker came along and started poking me. They obviously <gasps> thought like I was someone else. <laughs> so I was trying to sleep and this person starts poking me and I take the blanket off and she's like, ooh, sorry. <laughs> I'm like, That's all right, grandma, keep walking around. <laughs> keep Do doing your, your thing, Grams. Keep doing your lunges in the middle of the plane. <laughs> your lunges. Should have signed her up to the gym. They're so annoying because like, I, I spread out when I sit, so I hang over the edge a little bit. So yes. they're just like boom, walking into you every time. Every when you sit in the aisle, three seconds. When you sit on the yeah. house, it's the worst. I get hit by the, the cart all the time. Well, yes. Thomas is sitting there with a full lat spread. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you don't need to do that on the plane. No. CJ standing with his knuckles flared out, ready to fight. True spoken of someone who's never deadlifted over 250. Oh. <laughs> Oh man, and I never will, unfortunately. <laughs> Damn. I've tried it. I tried it when you were gone. Did you really? Yeah, oh, not recently. A few weeks ago. <laughs> another, another time. Yeah, another. there was another max yeah, at Heeny time. A month ago, I think. Yeah. yeah. And it, it broke the floor, and then I just gave up too early. Amazing. Mm. How have you guys been in my absence? I can't say it was that good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, man, we're bitter now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I bet. It's been <laughs> such a struggle. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, the boss isn't here. Yeah. No one breathing down my neck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Thomas is not like that, just to be clear at all. Can I change the grievance of the week? <laughs> <laughs> Something just came up right now. Um, yeah, well, where, where have you been, Thomas? What were you doing... Uh, did you say where you were? Did you just? Yeah, in the last podcast we talked about, I was shooting off to, to South Africa. Before we start, to, how's your training been, CJ? What have you been doing? You just oh. missed the whole segment. Why did? Okay. Well, I asked of, how you're going. That's and then my bad. You're just like, yeah, how are you going? <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's a Thomas show. Uh, <laughs> training. Um, yeah, this is my first week back f um, training after having COVID again, and the DOMS is terrible. I'm so sore. 
But um, it's fun. It's cool to be back into it. Uh, it's, I don't feel any weak or anything, which is cool. Um, but yeah, just super sore. Bridget gave me my next program <laughs> two weeks early, just so she she. <laughs> and there's so much volume in it. <laughs> it's almost like she just wanted to say like. Just so you know what's coming, see. <laughs> just so you know what's coming. It's just, yeah. But I am looking forward to doing it and, you know, getting stronger. Getting, You're going to kill it. Getting better, yeah. But you guys. My training's been a little bit of a mixed bag this week. Failed my squats on Monday. So let everyone take a lesson from my book and make sure you eat breakfast before you try and uh, <laughs> do the heaviest squats you've ever done. And dinner. <laughs> you shouldn't eat dinner or like, breakfast. <laughs> like an 18 hour nutrition. fast. Yeah. <laughs> So good, and uh, but no bench went really well, and I'm deadlifting tonight. So Ooh, let's see go. how that goes. Yeah. Nice, 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 nice. Um, my training has been really good. It's a uh, I'm on a little bit of a journey at the moment to better health, and I'm already at 57 k's of running since I started. Nice. Tomorrow morning I've got an 11 k run, which will be my longest run of this this cycle. As in 57 k's total. Yeah. So do you track the overall volume as you go? Yep. Yep. So it's all tracked on an app called Strava. It tracks everything, my heart rate, my cadence. um, And I wear like a smartwatch, a Garmin watch, which tracks everything. Yeah, nice. It's really cool to see. Um, (coughs) Sorry, do they use Strava for cycling too? Is it just? Yep. All endurance sports. Oh, sick. Um, So it's really cool. So tomorrow I've got a longish run. In the past I've done uh, way longer runs, but right now distance is uh, appropriate. What's for me? longish, like ten to fifteen? Yeah, but normally, normally that would be like a couple times a week. Yep. Um, obviously, the better you get, the more volume you can tolerate, and the more you can do. Um, but I'm just really enjoying this journey again. Running so freeing, and it's so good for my mind. And Wednesday night, on Wednesday night at a speed session, once again, speed's appropriate uh, to how fast I actually am. So it's cool just being able to hit the road and you know get my legs moving fast and short intervals and. Yeah, it's really fun. I'm enjoying it. And I'm lifting weights still. I've trained twice this week, did some deadlifts, did some bench press. Uh, everything's going good. Loving it. Let's go. Amazing. Mm. The, don't take this the wrong way. But is is height and stride length a limiting factor when it comes to running or does it not matter that much? Um, <clears throat> well, I don't know because there are lots of really tall runners that are really good. But Elliot Kipchoge, the fastest marathon in the world, is my height. Because I figure it's relative to the weight that you're carrying, right? Yeah. So I'm very, like, I wear, last year when I was running, I wore through my shoes really quickly. Yeah. Like, the shoes I wear, like, some people say out of those shoes, you should be able to get 600 kilometers. I got 311 kilometers out of them. Just because you're carrying more weight. Yeah. And I'm just so, I'm not a a runner. So I don't, you know, I'm actually going to go to a technique assessment session next week for running. So I can learn to run properly. Yeah, so all my shoes, my shoes were just fucked because yep. I don't know how to stride properly. I don't know wow. all that. And that's the other cool thing about Strava. Like you put all your gear in there too. So it tracks how many Ks your shoes have. Yeah, nice. Yeah, so it's really cool. But yeah, it's good. Damn. Awesome. Mm. And you've been working on your sleep routines? Yes. Yeah, my sleep routines are, it's getting better. Actually, I want to I wanna cover that in our topic. Yeah, sweet. So we'll talk about that soon. Sounds good. Mm. Sounds good. Um, yeah, so I shot off to South Africa to coach one of my lifters over there, Kurt Keo, um, which is really cool. You know, I've never seen powerlifting in in South Africa. I've been to South Africa before, um, just on tourism sort of stuff, and this time it was good to go over there and and do some do some coaching as well. Um, when we had the episode with Jordan Hellier and we were talking about like things we wanted to do before we die, uh, I said a shark dive. So just to continue the theme from the last podcast of inducing anxiety on the planners <laughs> so i booked my flight to sydney after we had the podcast so i flew the was it that night or the next day or something i can't remember it was that, that night it was that, that night. night yeah so i flew to sydney that night while i was walking from the airport to the pickup area waiting for my mum. i booked a flight to cape town once i landed i still didn't have my flight to <laughs> south africa in general <laughs> Got to her apartment, it's like 10 p.m., um, got the flight booked to South Africa, uh, booked accommodation for the first night, booked a car the next morning while I was walking to the uh, to the check-in desk at the airport, so got myself sorted. <laughs> <laughs> so I flew to Cape Town, and I did that specifically to do a shark dive, so I booked a shark dive the night before I flew as well. Um, 
Which sounds really excited, but it was it, it was really uneventful. It was oh. a, a bit of a disaster. Why? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, I had to I had to fly to Cape Town, which is like a two hour flight. Got like four to five hours of sleep because I got in really late at night, and then I had to drive three hours to the shark dive at a place called Hansbay. Uh, so I drove to Hansbay for the shark dive. Where? Hansbay. <laughs> uh, when we're doing the safety briefing, the ladies, I went specifically to see Great Whites. That's what I really wanted to do. And South Africa is famous for it. So we went to the safety briefing and she's like, yeah, a couple of years ago, these two orcas attacked a Great White. And after that, they ran away and we haven't seen them since. Like, oh, you could have put, <laughs> could have put that on the website. <laughs> Instead of, yeah. So on the website, it's like, you may get a chance to see a Great White. They know for sure they're not coming. They're uh-huh. Gornskis. Yeah. That's sad. There's been one sighted in the last like two years. Really? And it wasn't during a dive. It was just like during a during a sighting cruise kind of thing. Y- you're better off going for a surf in Byron Bay at this <laughs> yeah, stage. <no. laughs> there's, still sh- there's still sharks out there. So there's bronze whalers, which are huge. Uh, there's sharks called seven gills, which are pretty big as well. So we get out to the spot. They start chumming and throwing the bait. And straight away, these two massive sharks show up and start grabbing at the bait. I'm like, this is going to be sick. We're going to be seeing sharks nonstop. We're out there for three hours. It's going to be amazing. The cage takes about 10 people and there's 21 on the boat. So they stick the cage in while the sharks are there and then the sharks piss off. So they stick the cage in, 10 people get in the cage, 45 minutes, no sharks. <gasps> oh. Oh. Pull them out, chuck the next 10 in, 45 minutes, no sharks. <laughs> <laughs> so there's one person left, which is me. And she's like, I'm going to put you in the cage by yourself. Um, and then I'll offer anyone else to, to have a second round. Uh, and I've watched people. It's the Atlantic Ocean. It's like 13 degrees outside and probably colder in the water. So they're sitting there like freezing, even in their like super wetsuits and stuff. There's a three meter swell. So the whole time I've just been like <laughs> this on the boat, feeling seasick <laughs> as. So I watched it. And I'm like, I said to the woman, I'm like, Is, do you think any sharks will come? She's like, uh, maybe. So I'm like, you're not filling me with confidence. So I told her I'll wait 10 minutes. If a shark shows up, I'll get in the water. If it doesn't, we can pack up and go. And she's like, okay, let's do that. Waited 10 minutes, no sharks. They call it. They get out the, the water. They start packing away the cage. Three sharks show up. No. <laughs> yeah. So I saw, I saw oh, sharks and it was awesome. They're like coming out of the water, grabbing the bait, but I didn't see them in the water. In fact, yeah, I right. never got in the water. <laughs> <laughs> so the next try is going to be in Adelaide and I'm going to go with my friend Sam down there. We've been talking about it for years. So, What, is there more luck in Adelaide? Yeah, there's great white viewing in, in Adelaide as well. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah if you Adelaide's want other recommendations, uh, Corumban, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Byron <laughs> Bay. Great, great whites there. <laughs> Kira. Yeah. Kira so there's really no great whites in South Africa anymore? Well, I, I can't answer that question because I'm not an expert, but the, the spot where they normally are, they've all fled from. And I think wow. they, they stick out to other areas that are sort of inaccessible or yeah I, i'm not sure yeah i think this company needs to rethink their mm-hmm. <laughs> their procedures and maybe look for another spot where sharks go to. like a money back guarantee if you don't see any no, yeah. I mean, they're wild animals right yeah, and th- we did see sharks so yeah. I, I wasn't 100 percent disappointed and it yeah. was south africa so it was cheap as yeah, yeah. yeah. like it, it didn't cost me very much money so yeah, it was a cool enough experience that's yeah. sick yeah south africa is such like a <clears throat> it's such a foreign concept to a lot of us people like because no one really, you know, you hear people going to the UK, Europe, Asia for holidays, but no one really goes to South Africa. So, like, it's such a cool place. Y- the people are so nice. Yeah, it's got high crime, but so do lots of places mm-hmm. in the world. And if you go and do dumb stuff at the wrong time, you're probably going to get into trouble. Stuff can happen anywhere at any time. And yeah, you have to be careful and keep your wits about you. But uh, yeah, the weirdest thing about traveling anywhere like that is you don't know the rules. Like you walk down the street, you're like, can I say hi to this person? Do I make eye contact? Do I need to steer away? Do, if I look scared, does that make me a target? But you just go and relax and everyone says, hi, how are you, sir? Yeah, everyone's super kind and super nice. And the powerlifting scene is it's so much like here. Like everyone's just jokey and friendly. Everyone was super respectful and nice to each other. The actual competition was was cool. It was like a sort of a mini pro raw. Um, yeah, it was great. And Kurt killed it. Uh, for the most part, he bombed, but he, he had a great day other mm. than, than bombing. Um, and so there were a few lessons learned there, but he got like a 40-something kilo PB on his squat. He got mm. a massive PB, I think 17 PB on his 
uh, bench press. So he had a great day. He just yeah had a hard time. He tore his hand up real bad on his opening deadlift and dropped it at lockout and then just couldn't couldn't hang on to it for and the next two attempts. Even though he bombed, it was a very easy first attempt on deadlifts too, eh? So it's just very unfortunate. Yeah, yeah. It was it was a hand thing more than like it wasn't a poor attempt selection for the opener. Mm. We we didn't go too heavy. Um, I think the harder thing they face there is that they only get to touch a competition deadlift bar on their opener. Yeah. There's nothing in the warm-ups. Very few people have access yeah, wow. to them outside of that. And it was a rusty oaky. So if you've ever used an oaky, they're sharp, sharper mm. than Texas. And when they rust, they're extra sharp. Mm. So a lot of people tore their hands open. Because I've seen in a lot of uh, Kurt's training videos, which is um, really cool, and it's what we talk about, the entitlement of lifters. Kurt's training videos, it's all on commercial equipment. Yeah, yeah. He lifts in a, in a Virgin Active gym. We've got them here in Australia, but they're yeah they're just fully fledged commercial gyms, mm, and that's awesome to see him deadlifting x amount, squatting x amount, benching x amount on that equipment. When you like we've said before, we've got people like myself that can't bench over eighty kilos yeah. on something that's not a leco. And he, I mean, like even the warm up room, the warm up room was it was at a high school, the competition, and the warm up room, the, the the high school had a gym, mm. so it's just like if you went to an independent forty year old commercial gym here, that's the kind of equipment they had like homemade sort of benches, rusted old power bars that are sort of bent and flimsy and, and smooth. And um, yeah, like every, no one complained. Everyone just dealt with it, did their lifting because that's what they're used to. That's awesome. Yeah. That's so good. Yeah, yeah. So the, overall, the, the trip was great. It was really fun. It was really great to to meet new people, to see powerlifting over there, to see how, you know, it, it's always refreshing when you come back and you're involved in powerlifting politics and you see the people arguing back and forth and complaining about competitions and stuff like that. Things like this trip and these competitions and going to comps overseas just reminds you that we're all doing the same thing. And universally, powerlifting is really cool and powerlifters are really cool. Um, and it, it allows you to sort of disconnect from the three little letters that precede a powerlifting competition and focus on what we actually love doing. Um, so that's always a, a great reminder that sometimes we need. That's cool. Yeah. What was, um, <clears throat> were there any other standouts when you were over there? Were there any other freaks in South Africa that we don't know about over on our side of the world? Yeah, definitely. Um, everyone knows about Nicholas Dupria. It's not Dupri's, I learned. Dupria. Yeah. And you say Nicholas. Ooh. Yeah. Laka. <laughs> that's um, Laka. Yes. Um, a ph- phenomenal lifter. Like just unbelievable to watch unbelievably thick human just so did he compete as well yeah he he competed he squatted 430 bench 237.5 then went to deadlift 400 but same thing his hands like every single callus that could rip ripped off wait he squatted 437 430 430, 430. and it was easy what a, what because a, that's so hard to comprehend <laughs> same number because we've seen um we used to watch videos of him squatting stupid amounts with like one back spotter and yeah it's crazy Uh, unbelievable unbelievable and just super humble friendly nice guy everyone was everyone was just super cool Uh, but there was this guy that competed his name was colton he ended up bombing on deadlifts as well he was really sick in the week of the comp but if you find his it's cole powerlifting on instagram the guy squatted squatted 370 in training with no sleeves oh my god Just, just about this is a 110 lifter and he's taller than me so he's like tall lean squatted 370 deadlifted close to 380 absolute freak of a lifter um that is insane so he he didn't do very well on the day just because apparently he was really sick coming into the competition um a couple of the younger females were really strong and and cool to watch uh but yeah the the whole competition was really cool do you think it's a detriment uh our environment is a detriment to our progression as a lifter in comparison to like places like south africa like would you say having access to all this amazing equipment uh is detrimental to us no, nah, I'd say the opposite. Yeah? I'd say the opposite. Since, in Australia, since we've had places like this, the identification of talent has grown massively. Yeah, okay. Mm. Like to win nationals in, say, 2012 in the 82.5 kilo class, I think the total was under 600 or around 600. Yeah, wow. Versus now, if you're not, you know, going north of 800. Yeah. You know, the the quality of lifting, the identification of talent has has blown up since uh, the introduction of this kind of gym. And it, it's impossible to say what it is. Is it that it's allowed people to access better equipment and that's made them stronger? Is it the environment that's pushed people? Is it the general growth of the sport, the accessibility? It's it's probably a combination of everything. But no, I definitely wouldn't say it's a detriment. Yeah. I just love hearing these stories about, you know, your guys in Papua New Guinea, mm. uh, 
places like South Africa where they're just freaks of nature and they, you know, they don't have access to great equipment. Yeah. They, uh, some places they don't have uh, access to great nutrition and things like that. And they're still able to perform and do things that are fucking unheard of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I think definitely we, we can get a little bit spoiled. And I think if you haven't come from a background or seen what powerlifting's like in other places, if you haven't come from a background like, like I have where we didn't have these gyms, we always trained in commercial gyms as well, or when we did have these gyms, they were terrible. Um, I think that puts it into perspective a bit and you, you value it a little bit more. Uh, but I definitely don't think it's a detriment having access to this. It's it's the opposite for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it, it always raises the question for me, you know, like if, if South Africa did have something like zero or if other countries did have something like zero, uh, would that talent that already exists just go through the roof? Yeah, yeah. true. No, that's awesome. Mm. That's wild. Yeah. That's so wild. How strong people. I also got attacked by a monkey. <laughs> which is nice. Yeah. So I went to this monkey sanctuary. I actually went last time I was in South Africa. Someone recommended I do a day trip out to this dam. And while I was there, I saw a service station. I'm like, I recognize a service station. And I realized I was in the area with the monkey sanctuary. So I went to the monkey sanctuary. Normally it's like tours of 20 people. The tour guide was like, I've been here for two years and I've never done a tour with just one person. And it was just me. So, Oh, got, that's me. Yeah, I got How a pri good. private monkey tour. It was really cool. They're like all ex, um, like pickpocket monkeys or criminal monkeys or monkeys that have been rescued, you know, illegal pets and stuff. So they're all cheeky. And we were walking, there's the, these guardrails, this little monkey ran up behind me and like shoved me. I was like, oh, got pushed by this monkey. I turned around and it's got its teeth out. And it's like, ah, holy <laughs> shit, wants to, wants to have a fight right now. So I'm ready to punch on with this monkey. And the tour guide kind of shoves me out of the way and then whacks the monkey. He's like, you got. I have to show them dominance, otherwise they attack tourists and they bite wow. them and scratch them, and and um, people get really angry about it. So I have to, you know, yeah, keep them at bay. So he whacked it, and then they had a standoff. They were ready to go. This monkey was crazy. True. Yeah. <laughs> standoff. <laughs> That's damn. So Monkeys so are savages. What yeah. kind of monkey? How big was it? Uh, tiny, like this yeah. big. They're like those. Um, the monkeys out of like um, movies and yeah, I'm trying to think of which famous movies they're in. Friends. Yeah, I was thinking of um, what's his name, Marcel. Yeah, <laughs> they're, they're little like caiman monkeys with the funny heads and the black tops, and you yeah. you'd recognize one in a movie for sure. Um, they're little savages. I remember when I was in Japan, there's we went to this monkey mountain thing, and it's like don't make eye contact with the monkeys. I want, I'm like I want to see what happens. So I looked at one, and it was it was ready to kill me. I'm like, Ugh. <laughs> don't. <laughs> Don't look at monkeys. Don't look at monkeys. Nah, sorry, brother. Wasn't looking at you. Yeah. <laughs> I was looking past you, mate. Yeah. As you were. So, in the sink, like, what's the go with it? So they're being reformed. These monkeys. They've been in violent. They've had violent uh, criminal history. Well, is that <laughs> ex convicts? Is, is that is that Stockholm syndrome? Is that how that continues to happen? No, nah, I, th I think a lot of a lot of them have now been bred there and they just live there. But it's just like male dominant society is, yeah. is how monkeys operate anyway that's uh, crazy I, I think they just like to i just think it's crazy because like you know well, a big guy compared to this little monkey yeah, he, he's was, got, he was ready to go <laughs> he's got big nuts eh? yeah. <laughs> he's, i don't care if you're a power lifter <laughs> <laughs> that's there must be something about me i mean i got mauled by your dog yeah yes what which, which is like all three kilos of him yeah my Two. chihuahua foxy nah i've Mold said him. nah he bit thomas Get on the on face the nah that's raven's fault <laughs> raven <laughs> clod <laughs> Him. Yeah, Raven yeah. Clog scared my dog, and then he was scared off his his little uh, his little head, and then Thomas unfortunately was the first victim that got into close proximity, and he just freaked out and just nipped at him. I'm in talks with the council. Yeah, <laughs> I have big. I've got those big fences at my house now. <laughs> yeah, you know, can't have my dog. I uh, got a sign saying caution, dangerous dog. Yeah, yeah. He wears, wear. yeah, he wears a big cone around. His throat. Yeah, yeah, all three kilos of him. That's right. The subject for today's episode is, oh, actually, Thomas, before we start, I actually wanted to ask you about the food, the steaks and yeah, stuff you're eating. Yeah, that's right. How's the food yeah, there? Very good. That oh, looked hectic. Meal for two for one. That's, that's right. right. That's right. I mean, the way I eat when I travel is I tend not to eat anything during the day and then go have a massive meal at, at nighttime and just go ham. But our, our dollar is about 11 times their currency. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, a steak that would... You know where we went for the Christmas party? Yeah. You know, places like that where it would be over $100 for a big steak is like $30 there. Oh, sweet. Wow. So you can eat ridiculously like I like to eat for next to nothing. 
Yeah. Yeah, just unreal. I, I love the food over there. Is it the, would you, s- and they're just good at meat. Yeah, they're that's really what they're known for, meat. right? Yeah, bray. Bray. Are they better, is that the best steaks you've ever had or? No, nah, I mean, like the quality of steak in Australia is pretty hard to beat. I really? Think, yeah, the the way we sort of raise our cattle and, and look yeah. after them and how free ranging they are and they're not like uh, factory farmed, you know, mm. ma- makes the quality of the meat here pretty special. It's yeah. why we import, uh, export so much of it. I don't know that. Yeah. yeah. That's our biggest, ex- well, coal and mm. our cows. Yeah. Yeah, yeah right. Biggest, yeah. yeah. As someone that's been to a couple of fancy steakhouses in my time. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> sir. <laughs> uh, thanks to Thomas. <laughs> Um, sweet. Well, the next thing we want to talk about is <clears throat> focusing on these three things to crush your strength training goals in 2022. All right. Did you write 2021? <laughs> no, no, no. I just didn't know how to read it. <laughs> I didn't know how to read it. Okay. So the first thing is the first pillar that we have to tick off to crush our strength training goals in 2022 is training. All right. So what comes under training? What do you need to... I guess progressing your training, what I think you need to do is you need to follow a well-written program. Yes. Does everyone agree with that? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. and I think it's important we des- we define what well-written is. Yes. A lot of coaches and a lot of um, uh, people who, who run their own programming are in this pursuit of, of what's perfect mm-hmm. and in the pursuit of perfection – you can you can kind of miss some of the the bigger ideas that you need to satisfy. So there needs to be uh, progression over time, progressive overload. Uh, so a model of progression that happens over time. And sometimes you have to take a step back and and take a macro look at the program. So I mean, this comes down to how well you understand your own programming style. Um, but stop looking for what's best or what's perfect out of say. Um, you know, weekly based program, block periodization, percentages, RPs, all that kind of stuff. Just have a model of progression that works. If you're running a week to week program, there's nothing wrong with that. Just make sure that you're taking a step back and looking at how that influences the other weeks. It's, it's probably the biggest mistake that people make with weekly based programming is like, I feel good today. Therefore I'm going to push to what I'm capable of because that's what I should be doing. That's just revving the engine at 100% all the time and it's a fast track to slowing down your progress. And they want to look at it like a, a slingshot. You like you wind back the slingshot. It's a slow build so you can release, uh, you know, unleash the beast at the end when the time is right. Um, so it's, there's nothing wrong with being a bit conservative. And on the flip of that, if you're doing the opposite style, you know, block periodization, running in blocks, maybe even working off percentage or fi- uh, fixed numbers, uh, it's important to understand that the fixed number that you work of is something that's relevant to something that's going to drive progress, something that's possible to do. So it's not necessarily a case of working off your one rep max because we have to recognize that over time that's going to change. Uh, So it's working off a a number that allows you to map out training in a way that gets you to hit the numbers, reaches the right relative intensity and has a model of auto regulation built into it, acknowledge when you are feeling good or feeling bad. And it, the better you get at doing that, the less you need to auto-regulate. So what I'm trying to say here is that I feel like too many people these days are looking for what's the perfect program, what's the perfect programming style, what's the perfect exercise, what's the perfect performance of said exercise, rather than just picking a consistent style and doing it well. 100%. That's going to tr- that's gonna trump the pursuit of perfection one thing at a time um, is just doing something consistently well. Mm. I've had a few people say to me in their program, oh, I've got the same exercises that I, as I had last program. I'm like, yeah, well, you sucked at those exercises last program. Mm-hmm. I don't actually say that, but let's try to get better at these exercises. <laughs> Not only that. Let's try to execute these a little bit better. One thing that experience teaches you is that over time, we just do the same thing as on repeat anyway. Yeah, it's autopilot. Exactly. And mm. so like, you know, how many, how many lat variations can you do before you run out of lat variations? Not many. Mm. And so some people are going to require variety every now and then to, to prevent them from becoming stale. But the more experience you get, the more desirable general progress becomes and the more resigned you get to just doing the same thing over and over really well. The same thing done over and over really well is going to get way quicker results, way better results than trying to find the magic bullet every time. 100%. It's the same. And the importance of deloading as well. Before I came here, all the other programs I'd done with other coaches had never included a deload. So... Yeah, yeah for that, sure. Yeah, it works really well for me. Because I used to, um, I used to try avoid them, and I'd literally just crash and burn. Mm. 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 
Yeah, deloading de- de- deloading's an interesting thing as well. You know, you've got the constant argument again of like, do a pro- proactive deload versus a reactive deload. A well timed, a, a a well understood program that has a proactive deload built in is exactly the same in my eyes as a reactive deload. It's knowing your programming, the person that you're working with, so well that you can predict in advance when they are going to need a deload. And even if that prediction is a little bit off, you gather the data to change things for the next block until you do get it perfect. Um, deloading is about keeping the, the quality of training as high as possible all the time. And if we can keep the quality of training as high as possible all the time, we make better progress. It just allows us to continue to work towards this idea of consistency. So even if you deload when you don't need to deload, you know, you one session off needing to deload or something like that, it still allows you to not run the risk of, I'm just going to keep going. Oh no, I've gone too far. Now I've wasted a week of that. Now I've got a week of deload. Now you've wasted two weeks instead of just taking the week deload and keeping the quality of training high on, on average overall. And I think, again, this is the thing that people miss in the pursuit of perfection with programming, that they miss the bigger picture. They're only good at analyzing one or two weeks at a time rather than taking a step back and looking, what does this mean over the course of a year or over two years? And I understand that because it's easy for me to say because I've been doing this for 14 years and I've tried everything under the sun. And so now I have a really good handle on predictability with programming, on understanding programming style. And because of that, I can make accurate decisions from the start. Whereas if you're still figuring this out, the worst thing you can do for yourself is chop and change all the time. Stick to something for a while, gather data, make changes to that, monitor what the changes do, make more changes as necessary, but do it slow. Don't do it week to week. Do it like you know, six months to six months kind of thing. You have to build momentum. You, you cannot measure strength improvement, hypertrophy in one week. You can't even measure that in four weeks. It has to be done over a long period of time. So the more you change, the more confused you're going to get. Yeah, there's, and there's a few reasons. Uh, like, so a lot of people think a deload is, you know, you're taking a really easy week of training. That's why a lot of people don't want to deload, etc. All it is is we're just reducing the intensity and volume a little bit, uh, particularly on squat bench deadlift. Uh, for us in our sport, specific to powerlifting, um, <clears throat> but it doesn't mean you train. Doesn't mean your training has to be uh, lazy or so. Like you still want to train. You still want to yeah. train properly and train hard. Uh, you still want to make sure you're executing all your executing your program, executing your exercises properly. We're literally just taking a a reduction in intensity and volume. Um, there's other factors that will come into why we deload. If someone's got really sore arms from doing low bar, that week we won't do low bar. We'll do safety bar. Mm-hmm. Uh, if someone gets really banged up shoulders from bench press, that week we're not benching. Uh, we're doing other things. Like It doesn't just mean your training goes to shit in a deload week. Mm-hmm. You're still training hard. Mm. Mm. Nothing changes except literally the number on the bar, mm. how many sets and reps we're doing. For sure. Mm. So... Uh, if you're a coach listening to this, you know, it's so easy to get distracted by all the noise about like, no, RPE is the best because of this. Block periodization is the best because of this. Percentages are the best because of this. It's so easy to, to get caught up in that noise and then get insecure about what you're doing. Listen to it. Pay attention to it. Keep it in the back of your mind. Let it challenge any biases you have. But if your program is working, just keep doing it. Yeah, for sure. If your programming style is working, just keep doing it and get better at it. And then later on, you can decide if you need to make a change or not. Um, But, you know, the best program is a program that gets results. Yeah, for sure. Uh, And the more you chop and change, the more inconsistent your data and your results are going to be. So just just have faith and trust and and don't get so caught up in the noise. You know, people will send me examples of so-and-so, you know, bagging on one programming style or an exercise or something like that and be like, what do you think of this? You don't do this. I'll be like, cool, I do what I do and guess what? I've coached some of the best people ever. Mm. So something's working. I'm still going to keep doing what I do. I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. I'm going to allow it to challenge me and if I can justify in my head to keep doing what I'm doing, I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. And so as you know, you have to take a step back and just be confident in your own methodology, be confident in the results that you're getting and make changes when you need to make changes. Yeah. There's, um, I just want to touch on as well. There's a very common theme amongst people that are heavily biased towards RPE training. Uh, they're like, so if you come into a session and you're doing percentage based training, you've got X amount, you've got a 280 kilo squat, but you haven't had good sleep. You haven't had, uh, you haven't had uh, good nutrition that day. You're not going to be able to squat 280. That's that's a lot of the argument with uh, in our industry with RPE training. But 
If you do have that number written in, guess what you're going to do when you come in? You're going to auto-regulate anyway. You know you're not going to be able to hit 280. Mm-hmm. You're not even going to try. Like, it's it's all very much the same thing. Yeah, I mean, like, the 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 thing everyone has to remember when it comes to the, the weight that you put on the bar when you're doing a training session is that the weight you put on the bar has an RPE when you lift it. The weight that you put on the bar is a percentage of something. They are literally the same thing. Like regardless of which methodology you use to drive programming, it's more about your understanding and your ability to educate the client or yourself on how to use this program that's going to drive the progress. It's not about which method is better or worse. Like I've, I, I'm happy to say to everyone that we use percentage-based programming at zero, but the automatic assumption when you hear percentage-based is that you're thinking percentage of one rep max. No, the question is always percentage of what and how we pick that number is based on years and years of data that I've collected and that I understand so that I can pick an input number that spits an output training number that accounts for the kind of fatigue that you generate, the kind of discrepancies that you're going to run into week to week. Because even if you are well attuned to auto regulation using an RPE scale, it's still guesswork. Just like if you're not feeling good on the day and you've got percentage work, it's still guesswork as to the number that you'll put to create the relative intensity. Both tools are absolutely fantastic. We use both tools regardless of which your primary is. We still use RPE in our programming for sure. It's just about understanding how to drive your programming. And the more that people get caught up into in terms of figuring out which one is best, the more led astray they become. It's not about what's better or worse. It's about how you use it. It's about how you build it into your programming and how you deliver it. Because I would be 100% confident that I could write programs completely RPE-based, which I have in the past, and still get the same level of results because I understand how my training works, how my programming works. That's all it comes down to if you're a coach or someone programming yourself. Get a good idea of what your programming is actually doing. Again, be conservative, be slow, make changes slowly, and you'll get there. It's, it's the same as nutrition. Like, with nutrition, when you think about, and this comes back to exercise selection as well, when you think about what you actually eat, all of you eat the same things on repeat. Yeah, it might change week to week, might change month to month, but you go to like a number of foods that's relatively limited that you eat. You know, you don't, you don't cycle through, through hundreds and hundreds of different meal ideas and options. You pretty much eat the same thing when you map it out over time. And training is much the same. We do the same thing over and over. So stop getting caught up in the minutia and just focus on getting a consistent, solid training plan. That's when you're going to see results. Nice. So good. All right. The next bullet point under training is lifting with good technique. Oh, you mean a waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> I think this one's um, important. There's a lot of... There's a lot of uh, information out there at the moment saying like there is no good tech there is no perfect technique there is what is good technique it doesn't exist but there is to an extent like a safe technique uh now i'm talking really broadly here like there's really bad ways to do certain exercises um and we with with training we obviously want to be able to come in week to week and get our sessions done we want to avoid injury there's a reason why obviously the way we lift it's the strongest safest most efficient we believe is the strongest, safest, and most efficiently uh, efficient way to move the load from A to B. But there's also an element of safety to it too. So good technique. What do you think? What do you guys think? It's very important. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> yeah of course, it's important. It's essential. Yeah. Um, coming in here and doing my technique session, it completely changed the way I lift. Shot my numbers up straight away. Felt more stable. You know, twist your quads out. Hold your brace on. Keep a tight upper back. Yeah, technique is absolutely essential. Perfect. Yeah, uh, like this whole idea of what is good technique and there's no such thing as perfect technique. It's such a it, it's such a funny thing when you pick it apart because someone that says there's no such thing as perfect technique that gets someone who lifts outside of their ideal of what's their range of acceptable technique will change something. Like so it's a lie. Mm-hmm. It's just it's it seems so 
it seems so final to say like I believe there is a perfect technique for a squat and a lot of people aren't secure enough in what they believe or understand of what that lift or the lifts are to the point where that they're, they're willing to say that even though they don't realize they believe it mm -hmm. so it's like oh no the squat can be done in a variety of ways it's like that variety of ways is your definition of good technique because if the squat falls out of that variety of ways you change it as a coach so it's a lie to say that there's no such thing as good technique. You believe it. You just might not have an idea of what perfect or the one good technique is. Uh, whereas me and Zero, we believe that there is a gold standard of technique that we are constantly working towards. Uh, and again, like you can argue and be like, no, 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 you can't make everyone lift the same. It's like, well, yeah, we can build everything on the same series of principles. And guess what? It's worked. Mm, 100%. Like, Show me a lifter that's benched more than my lifter in Australia. Oh, wait, you can't. <laughs> you know, but, um, like that's, that's a really arrogant statement. But what I'm, saying, <laughs> what I'm saying is as long as it's delivering results, you have to fall back on the principles that you understand. And so I think where people get confused here is that they think that the notion of a perfect technique or a global technique means that you put everyone in exactly the same position. You have to be low bar. You have to have your feet at this stance. You have to have your feet at this angle. Perfect technique is more about what are the underlying principles that we're looking for and how can we work towards those. And that becomes ultra individual then because people think perfect technique automatically means it cuts the idea of the individual out. In, uh, in, in essence, it does the opposite. It really focuses on how can we take this individual and get them to express perfect technique. And the more you look at it like that, the more you arrive back full circle at this idea that, well, actually we're all the same animal doing the same thing. And within this, there's certain rules that apply to everyone. Because of that, there's queuing systems that can be one size fits all. And once you unlock that, whoa, your results go through the roof. Uh, like think of, think of it like this. Doing a squat, queuing a squat, exactly the same for everyone, would be exactly the same as queuing someone to blink. Mm -hmm. So think of like, you know, a, a blink, you know, closing your eyes and opening it. Think of how you'd put that into language to someone. You don't have to complicate it. You say exactly what to do. If you can understand the principles that underlie movement, you can find language that every single person can digest and understand and perform. The problem is there's so much noise in the industry. There's so much telling us, no, don't do that. That's a bad idea. Global, a global application of cueing and, and technique is a bad idea. Once you understand it, it's the best idea ever. And the irony is, is that if you don't believe that, you do it anyway. Mm -hmm. You do it anyway. You look at your clients and you're like, no, that doesn't fall within my ideal of the squat. You need to change this. What's the difference? The only difference is I'm admitting that I do the same thing for everyone. Yeah. We always talk about as well when we when we uh, do our technique assessment sessions, we always talk about we're all built differently. Like I'm built differently to you. You're built differently to CJ. CJ's built differently to Bridget. But the rules remain the same. Mm. It doesn't matter. Yeah, I mean, like if we were to put it, I use the blinking analogy, but let's put it back into actual lifting. It doesn't matter your limb length, your lever length, your age, your weight, your gender. It doesn't matter any of that. I guarantee you all coaches will teach the brace the same for every single person. Mm -hmm. Their understanding of what the breathing and bracing is will apply to every single person. That's how we need to look at the shoulders, the hips, how they're applied then into the squat, the bench, the deadlift. If we can figure those underlying principles out, we can have a a level of understanding of these lifts that allows us to have a, con a complete consistent communication system to lifters to get them to move how we want them to move. Then once we have that, we can individualize it if whatever is happening isn't working for whatever reason. And the more you get global, the less you have to individualize because the more you, uh, the more you get global, the more people just understand what you're saying. That's what we are really good at doing. That's what I teach in the coach development system. That has been the foundation of what has built this brand. Make no mistake about that. Yes, sir. Uh, the next pillar on the three things to crush your training strength goals, strength training goals in 2022 is recovery. Does anyone have anything to come under recovery? I'll start first. Sleep. <laughs> Sleep is a huge one. I'm not very good at it. But I'm getting better. Two nights in, baby. Yeah, that's it. Two nights in a row. I've got some, uh, I guess you could call it underlying health issues that uh, prevent me from sleeping very well. But I'm getting better at it. So I'm doing little things to implement uh, into my nighttime, I guess you could say routine, to help me sleep. And it's made the world of difference just in the last two days. So for context, on average, I reckon I sleep about two, two to three hours max a night. 
it's not uncommon. It's been forever, eh, Thomas? Yeah. It's not uncommon that I'd sleep an hour a night. Mm. It's not uncommon I wouldn't sleep at all. I'd come in fucking drained and but you just get on with it because I'm so used to not sleeping. But these last, uh, I've been making a conscious effort to get better at sleeping. I'm going to say the things that I've done. This is biohack Henny talking. Yeah, biohack. <laughs> all right. Shout out Andy Davis, actually. He put me on, on onto a lot of this stuff. So <clears throat> supplementation for me before bedtime. No, let me start here. Caffeine. I've reduced the amount of caffeine I'm drinking during the day. Mm-hmm. It got really bad. So at one stage, I was actually almost at a, almost a gram a day. Nice. Yeah, so it's <laughs> nice. So that's really bad. So now I'm having one coffee a day. Mm. I've got a non stim pre workout. So I'm having about 80 milligrams of caffeine. Mm-hmm. So that's already, that was the first thing I did to uh, improve my sleep. Could you explain what a non stim pre workout is? Um, to be honest, I don't really know. It's, for me, it was just no caffeine. It's called a nootropic. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it, it, just think of a pre workout that doesn't have caffeine. Oh, it actually doesn't have caffeine? Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's aiming to do the same thing. Uh, aiming to improve focus, basically, without the stimulant effect. I've got a I've got a bottle of unopened stuff at home that I'm never going to use. Does Is it re- that loco? I'm not sure. Remind me and I'll bring it in. Because you had a really good one here. Um, I don't even know if you knew it was non-stim. Yeah, I I, I can't remember. I I'm pretty sure um, Dave and Jen from Concrete. Yeah, they sent it out to me as a as a gift. Um, but I don't really use the stuff. Mm. Um, so yeah, remind me. I've got some at home. Yeah, yeah cool. Um, yeah, so reduce my caffeine. Uh, I had started taking a non stim pre workout. Uh, my nighttime routine. This one's pretty crazy, but I bought these glasses that I uh, wear at nighttime now. They're like a blue light blocking glass. They're the color of like a, I guess you call it amber red. So it's like a sunset color that you put on. It kind of just resets your circa- uh, circadian rhythm. You might have seen Eugene Teo wear them on his story. Mm-hmm. So he wears them. And um, I wore them for the first time last night, and it was crazy. It's the equivalent, you know, when you turn nighttime mode on your phone? Yeah. And, yeah. But like, we're, we're not just sensitive to screens. Mm. We're sensitive to all light. And we yeah. work, uh, the circadian rhythm works on when light goes away, you get tired. Yeah. And all it does is dampen the, the light that's coming in. So it makes you really tired. It was actually unreal how fast it worked too. Because I was wired when I got home. I was like, shit, I haven't actually had any caffeine, but I feel like tonight's a night I'm not going to be able to sleep. Put these glasses on, started work, started doing their magic. Uh Two is not being stimu- uh, three, not being so stimulated before bed. So now I'm not watching TV before bed mm-hmm. or at least half an hour to an hour before bed. This is all things I've been trying to implement over the last few weeks. I'm just slowly getting better at it. Mm-hmm. Uh, four, su- supplementation. So I don't know if this is a, I don't know what the science behind these subs are or anything like this. These are all recommendations. And when you haven't slept for so long, these are things you're willing to do. Um, so I start taking ashwagandha, mm-hmm. valerian root. Mm-hmm magnesium and there's one more thing in there that i'm taking before bed zinc zinc yes so i'm taking those four things before bed and i'm also drinking uh it's i can't it's like a chamomile tea it's not chamomile it's a different brand but it's like a uh i can't remember the name of the brand but they do sleeps uh they do teas for like anxiety uh, and things like that there's a from you know what t3 is yes Mm -hmm. the tea shop they do one called sleepy tea yep yeah, so it'll be a similar thing. Yeah, and it's so good. So I'll drink that an hour before bed while trying to read or do a little bit of reading. Mm. Um, and then the fifth one, fifth or sixth one is... Have a wank. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, nah, not have a wank. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, no we, it's, I'm a health scientist. <laughs> oh, okay. For science, yeah. any. No, actually. Not, not for a guilty pleasures or anything. Yeah, I am. Um, Who's I, guilty? <laughs> Can't be guilty if no one knows. <laughs> yeah, I have a clear conscience. <laughs> um, I actually downloaded the Calm app. Mm. So meditation. Oh, nice. And it's something I never, ever thought I'd be into. So what is it? Breathing stuff? Yes. Mm. So the breathing stuff's the best stuff. And it just it literally, I've always laughed at meditation, things like that. Mm. So for me, it's a real foreign concept to be conscious and be like mindful just for those three minutes or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've got a, I'm on a streak, so I'm on a nine day streak with a total of, what was it, 3 hours and 45 minutes of mindfulness. Nice. So I've done 3 hours and 45 minutes of meditation in nine days. Mm-hmm. And it, yeah, it's like getting benefits from it, not only sleep, the sleep uh, has only started getting good, like I said, the last two nights, but it's mm-hmm. been getting better. So that is one of the things for recovery, sleep. Anyone else got anything to add to sleep? Yeah, sleep Sleep is, you know, sleep and nutrition are the, the 95, 98% that's going to make up your ability to recover. All the other stuff is 
additional, but you know, um, it would be like, oh, I'm, I'm, you know, CJ starts blasting gear again. That's it. No, <laughs> CJ starts blasting gear, <laughs> and he's he's getting three hours of sleep a night, and he's like, why am I performing so bad? I'm on all this gear. It's like, no, you got to focus on things that actually matter. Um, you can't l- rely on crutches, and a lot of a lot of people do what you're doing there, but then don't actually sleep well. Mm. And they say, "I'm I'm doing everything I can, but I'm not I'm not recovering well." It's like because you're not actually sleeping or you're not eating well. So, those two things are really important. I think the thing to note with um, sleep hygiene and sleep routines is that it is very individual. You know, the, the same things are not going to work for everyone. Like you know, when it comes to the concept of meditation, some people are going to find meditation in, in other areas. So for for me, for example, if I try to read before bed, I'll just get angry. I'll get frustrated because I can't really read. Uh, whereas me, if I play the piano, even though it takes a lot of mental focus, I can do it in a way that relaxes me and meditates me. And same thing, I can work until I fall asleep. So I can I can look at the screen and be on the screen and then go straight to sleep. But if I'm working and my mind is wired, I have to switch off and that's when I'll do, go do something like play the piano. And lots of, pe- lots of people will fall asleep by watching TV. Um, so we don't want to demonize anything, but we have to say that you know finding a routine that does work for you is really important when it comes to sleep hygiene. And a lot of it just comes down to, you know, you've intrinsically worked out, okay, I need to prioritize this. Mm. And when people say, I can't sleep or I don't sleep enough, they're aware of it, but they're not prioritizing the process of getting more sleep. Yeah. Oh, what, when I was talking about my stuff before, I don't want to demonize anything, any one of those things I've been trying to no, eliminate. No, no, no. And I know you weren't. Yeah. Because a lot of people find their peace in those things. Yeah. Yeah. Even like scrolling Instagram or something like that. The important thing, you know, reducing screen time is more about like just reducing actual time on the screen rather than the damage of the screen itself. Like so many people will lie in bed for two more hours messaging people or scrolling through shit. That just wastes time that's that's not conducive to the time that they need to sleep. So it's okay to be on your phone or watching TV or on your computer right before bed. But if you're wasting time doing nothing, nothing productive or nothing helpful to you, and that's cutting into your sleep time, that's when you have to question, you know, do I need to cut my screen time down or shift it to somewhere else during the day or... You know, once you once you time audit yourself, you t- take a step back and look at where you spend your time through the whole day, you'll realize how much time you waste doing nothing. Um, and that's not to say everything needs to be productive, but there's time wasted doing stuff that is neither productive nor relaxing. You know, we're really good at finding stuff to just stress us out because we don't have lions and tigers and saber tooths after us anymore. You know, <laughs> so we like to find stuff that just stresses us out and wigs us out. Um, so sleep hygiene is really about being intrinsic and finding what works for you. How can you prioritize getting to sleep and then rolling with it? Awesome. So the third and final pillar on how to crush your strength training goals in 2022 is the biggest one, the most important one. It's how we all got better. Consistency. Absolutely. Just back on the um, uh, the recovery side of things, you know, nutrition is a whole topic topic in itself but that's tied up in there right recovery in, involves not just sleep but also the food oh, you're eating my bad i skipped that no but we, yeah. we don't really have the time and we need to get rochelle on here and have a full nutrition podcast at some stage anyway yeah sweet let's do it yeah all right um let's wrap things up then because no, we didn't oh, say anything about consistency <laughs> shit i suck at Wait, this what's the time <laughs> sorry cj no, i got a, I got a minute before we have to wrap things up but consistency does anyone want to touch on consistency I feel like I spoke about it in the programming bit, but again, like the best plan done inconsistent is going to be worse than a plan that's not perfect, but done consistently over time. Mm. Like ultimately that's what breeds results is taking a step back and looking at th- how things happened over time. And you can go hard for six weeks and then shit for 10 weeks, or you can go lukewarm for 16 weeks and that'll be 10 times better just because of the consistency aspect. Bad example, but you know what I'm saying. Consistency over time basically trumps everything else. 100. And consistency yeah. in everything too. Sleep, yeah. nutrition, training. Yes, all sir. That. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Firing at 85% all the time is bettering, better than firing at 100%, 50% of the time. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. You miss 100% <laughs> of the shots you don't take. <laughs> <laughs> Tom Bro Jordan. <laughs> nah, that's Wayne Gretzky. Oh, yeah. My bad. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll take Tom Bro Jordan. Well. <laughs> Tom Bro Jordan. Absolutely. All right. Andy's got to go do his coaching thing. Sweet. Give us five stars. Contact us for coaching. We love you all. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.
Thank you so much for listening to the Zero Podcast. If you want more information, head to our Instagram, zero underscore weakness. Hit the link in the bio for all of our services and any information on upcoming workshops and events. Don't forget to leave us a five-star review so we can have a broader reach and answer more people's questions. Thank you once more.